We're live. Uh, hey, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Stanford MOSIS seminar series. I'm Karan. Uh, we have with us today Dan, Hero, Peter, and our guest today, Roy Frosted from Google. Um, <clears throat> just before we get started, obviously, uh, I want to share some uh, good news. Um, we hit 1,000 subscribers this week, so thanks so much for tuning in, uh, and hope you've been enjoying the episode so far. Um, and thanks also to everybody who filled out our form for future topics and speakers. Uh, really appreciate you taking time to do that. Um, and subscribe to the channel if you've not done that yet, so that we can keep taking those numbers up. Um, so this week, we're going to be talking to Roy about Jax. Uh, he's going to be um, talking about his work at, uh, at Google, and, and a lot of you probably have heard of Jax. So um, Jax is a system for high-performance machine learning research, and it's become, becoming increasingly popular. Um, and Roy is a research scientist at Google. He uh, got his PhD from Stanford, actually working with Chrissy, and he is very interested in machine learning systems and the foundations of, uh, of building software systems for ML research. Um, so the plan, as always, is going to be Roy's going to give a talk uh, for 30 minutes, followed by a podcast style discussion. And if you're in the live chat, then you can keep spamming questions in and we'll keep track of those and, and get those across to Roy uh, during the discussion. So um, Roy, take it away. Thanks. Thanks. It's, uh, <clears throat> it's great to be back in, uh, in the old computer science department. Um, I, uh, I really like what you've, uh, what you've done with the place. Uh, <laughs> let, me, uh, let me try to share my screen here. Is that <clears throat> all right? Does this look like uh, like it's working? That's great. Fine. Great. So, um, one second. All right. So this is going to be um, an overview of JAX, which is an open source uh, research project that comprises a, a system for writing machine learning and scientific computing programs. Uh, but after I give the overview, I'll also try to step back uh, later on and, and highlight some lessons we've learned while making it, and, and maybe to gesture at some research directions in this space. Um, on the project itself, uh, we, we started work on Jackson around 2017. We were a few uh, machine learning researchers with, with varying compilers backgrounds uh, and some opinions about automatic differentiation. Uh, two of us had previously worked on, a, on an autodiff package called Autograd, which is a fairly minimal uh, but quite influential autodiff package. Uh, and then, uh, and then JAX has grown over the past couple of years. Uh, we have a larger handful of both researchers and engineers involved now. Of course, everything that I'm presenting here today uh, integrates over everyone's excellent work and ideas. Um, so let's get started. All right, so, so to get into what JAX actually is, it's probably easiest to start with an example of using it. Uh, I'm guessing that drawing up a neural network uh, is a good start, since that should be a familiar thing in this audience. Um, so let's consider this, this question here. How would we write and train a deep neural network from scratch in Python? Uh, specifically, how do we write it from scratch without missing out on hardware performance uh, and without missing out on the ability to scale up our example when we're finished and, or, or as, we're, as we're writing it? This, um, <clears throat> this function here implements a multi-layer perceptron. Uh, it's a plain old Python function. Okay? It, it takes an example's input features as one argument it takes a list of model parameters as another argument, and it runs a little loop over the network layers and then returns predictions. Just to clarify this loop here, we've written this so that the parameters in the list come in pairs, WV, a weight matrix, and a vector for every layer. We do a dot product um, and a nonlinearity and, and, and outcome the scores. Okay. This second Python function here implements uh, a loss function, and it takes uh, parameters, so given parameters and a batch of examples, it's going to call the prediction routine and then compute the squared loss. So we've written out some math to express and model um, to express a model uh, and a loss. How do we transform this into something that trains fast um, uh, to our liking? So there's a few things that are missing here. So to optimize the list of parameters that we're giving this as input, we'd like to use a gradient method. We'd like the gradient uh, of this loss in order to execute uh, efficiently, we need to take advantage of hardware acceleration. Better yet, uh, beyond just plain old hardware acceleration of operations, we'd like to send the entire function or, or our entire functions through an optimizing compiler if we can, and then send that to an accelerator. 
and make it even faster. And finally, we'd like to scale up these procedures to what might be a big machine that we have on hand or even to multiple machines. So in this, using this example, I just want to step through how JAX would do each of these or how you might do each of these in JAX in turn. Just to begin, um, to run operations on an accelerator, JAX implements most of the standard NumPy interface. So we're just going to tweak the example here uh, to import JAX.NumPy in place of NumPy. And we're basically done uh, with that step. Now, each operation is going to run on the accelerator. These operations dispatch asynchronously. Uh, the arrays remain on device in between calls to operations, uh, kind of everything you might expect in that regard. Uh, next up, uh, we want to take some gradients. So JAX's remaining features, gradients and onward, they're going to operate on Python functions. So they, they're higher order functions. They accept a Python function and they return a Python function. And we call these, just for as, as our own jargon, we call these function transformations. So to compute the gradient of our loss, we're simply going to import jax.grad and use that to transform the loss function. What comes out, again, is a Python function. This Python function, given parameters and an example batch, are going to return the losses gradient with respect to the parameter list at the given parameter list, if that makes sense. Okay. Now, um, because what comes out of this, this uh, function gradient fun, is a plain old Python function, we can actually continue to apply any of Jax's other transformations. This is what we mean when we say the transformations compose. So for example, I can import Jax.vmap and compose it with grad to give another, uh, to give, to give another example here. Vmap uh, is, is a short word. It's, a, it's, a short for, it's short for vectorizing map. One way to think about a map uh, in general is that it turns a function on a point into a function on a batch of points, where the batch in this case is going to be processed jointly using vectorized operations that correspond to what's in the original function. Okay, so this helps saturate memory and compute resources uh, all at once, kind of uh, by, by processing all these points concurrently. Now, when we vmap uh, the gradient function with respect to the second argument, that's what's in this in access, what this in access uh, specifies here, this in access argument, we're going to get an efficient per example gradients function. Okay, so vectorized per example gradients is actually a somewhat elusive procedure in the sense that it's not available in every uh, sort of off the shelf in every modern neural net library, usually because those are optimized for aggregate gradients, which is what we do in stochastic gradient descent. But here, uh, suppose we wanted per example gradients. We've constructed it in a single line by just composing two transformations, vmap with grad. All right, so next up, let's compile things. Let's compile things end to end. Uh, for that, we import jax.jit, which is short for JIT compilation or just in time compilation. Uh, jax.jit uses the XLA linear algebra compiler to do compilation just in time. Semantically, JIT is actually a funny transformation in that it's just the identity function. In goes a function, and out comes a function that computes the exact same thing. Uh, but it's instead backed by a compiled device kernel, uh, compiled and optimized by XLA. Now, we can also um, think of, going back to VMAP, we can also think of using maps not to vectorize, but to parallelize. So whereas, vectorize, whereas VMAP is a vectorizing map, JAX.PMAP is a parallelizing map. It maps a function over a batch of points uh, by processing each point in parallel on uh, parallel devices, okay? or parallel cores, or, or what have you. So I'm going to replace vmap by pmap in the per example gradients uh, line here. And now since the transformations compose, actually, I, I didn't do this on the slide, but we could have used both. right? So we could use vmap to saturate each device with a batch of points, and we could have then used pmap to map those batches over devices. Um, so Anyway, you get the idea. Uh, now, you know, the, the, there's, the, there's more devices on the right. Uh, the upshot here is that JAX's interface is just NumPy plus function transformations, at least, at least out of the box. Um, you don't see many artifacts of what we might be used to in a machine learning framework at this level, at least. Uh, there's no pre-specified layer construct. Uh, there's no variable with a capital V. Uh, there's nothing here that is distinguishing uh, an array of network parameters from an array of input features that we're giving as arguments to this function. Now, if you if you are really into you know if you're if you're deep into the domain of deep nets and you want abstractions like layers and dropout and so on, those do exist. Uh, there are deep net libraries built on top of JAX. They come with standard model definitions, training routines, and everything. 
Um, but I just want to stress that that's not captured by the core JAX system. Okay? And, and you might arrive at the need for transformations like GRAD or, or Autodiff uh, for compilation, for vectorized maps and so forth from other numerical domains, like actually many of us uh, who, who started the project originally did. Um, maybe you work on scientific computing or simulation, maybe you work on optimization and control, probabilistic modeling and so on. I mean, ultimately we're, we're kind of in search of that common programming the common set of programming primitives that underlie all of these domains at once that we roughly call machine learning and numerical computing. So whatever you do in machine learning, we do have sort of one hypothesis in this design, um, and, and that's that your work proceeds by first expressing some mathematical function in order to specify a model or a problem or an objective, and later transforming that function in, in creative ways uh, to derive a program that let's say trains that model or solves that problem or minimizes that objective. So we can also imagine other transformations. Uh, for example, uh, given a function, here, here's just one example that I like. Uh, given a function that accepts a source of randomness and produces a single sample, that, that's a, a, a random process. So can you turn that into the log density function described by that sampling procedure? There, there are others who have actually built that uh, using JAX's internal machinery. Uh, there's a library called um, Oryx in open source, which, which does uh, something like that, and there are others as well. Uh, and, the, and the question might be, how did they do that? And, and the answer is that JAX's internal machinery is actually extensible. So out of the box, like I said, it's, it's um, interface is NumPy plus transformations, and hopefully those serve you. Uh, but one layer beneath that, it's actually a transformation engine of sorts, and, uh, and that transformation engine can be extended. So in other words, if we hadn't written VMAP, uh, you could have. Uh, is at least a hope. Um, I want to continue this example uh, interactively so that we're not just reading code on slides uh, for, for quite a while. So let's see if this works. Um, I'm going to have to maybe change, let me fiddle with the screen share a little bit. All right, this is a, a CoLab notebook um, with a little demo in it. Let me make sure that all the cells are cleared, clear all outputs. And let me show you, I'm gonna connect this collab to, um, to a GPU. So let's make sure that the, all right, we've got a GPU behind this uh, collab. Once we connect it, um, this is you know, this is a notebook with cells that you execute uh, and then the output should come out when we, when we run them. And reconnect. Great, okay. So in this first cell, I'm just importing JAX and its NumPy interface. Um, there's also uh, a random module that, uh, that JAX uh, has separately from NumPy. Um, I won't go too much into the detail of why we have a different randomness module. It roughly, it, roughly speaking, it's because JAX requires that your code be functional or written in a functional style. And so this is a random uh, RNG. Um, there's more on that in the, in the repository readme. I'm going to make a random key, and then I'm going to, to generate some random data. Um, here, I'll make an array that's 5,000 by 5,000 large. Uh, as you can see, it has a, a shape and a d-type, just like your NumPy, uh, and it is uh, 5k by 5k float32. Um, we can do things with this array that you might expect from NumPy, like multiply it against itself and look at the first entry. All right, there you go. It's 63 point stuff. Um, and if we actually try to kind of print or, or evaluate uh, uh, this, this original random array, um, we can see that it looks a lot like a NumPy array. It's got a floating, uh, you know, it's got numbers in it, uh, random numbers. Uh, but this little device array uh, prefix here indicates that it's sitting on the GPU that I've, uh, that I've connected. Okay, so it's sitting in the memory of the GPU ready to be uh, operated on. But still, we can treat it just like a NumPy array. Uh, that means that we can import, import a PyPlot uh, and plot the first uh, row, and that looks like uh, you know a random row of data. Uh, we can multiply this thing by its transpose. Uh, we have the full power of NumPy, or essentially the full power of NumPy, with a few documented exceptions. So we can also do uh, all the funny indexing, or a lot of the funny indexing that NumPy allows. And you can just trust me that those numbers uh, are what you'd expect if you indexed uh, in that way. Those look like, importantly, those look like healthy GPU numbers. Um, 
And, uh, and again, maybe just as further evidence that this is running on the GPU, I can import the original NumPy, the standard NumPy, as ONP and take a dot, and time a dot product on, on what should be the CPU. And I can do the same thing with our array. And yeah, so one takes you know, th 3.8 seconds, and the other takes 60 milliseconds. Um, so hopefully that's some evidence that, that this is running on, on accelerated hardware. Let's do some automatic differentiation. I'm going to import grad and look at this funny function here. So this function, <clears throat> uh, if the argument is positive, it's going to run it. It's going to evaluate a cubic. Uh, and if the argument is negative, it'll evaluate a linear function. We can generate a random scalar and call this function sort of on either side, on a positive and negative. Uh, it looks like the, the random scalar was originally negative. So in one case, we see that the gradient is indeed 3. Uh, the derivative is 3 of, of this branch. Um, and uh, it's 0.25 in the other in the other case. Again, transformations compose. Uh, I can't say this enough. And so, uh, if you want higher order derivatives, that's just repeated application of the derivative. Uh, so here, so here we can take grad of grad. We can take grad of grad of grad of grad of grad of grad. You know, eventually uh, we'll hit a zero, a constant zero, and that that should be that should be correct. Um, here's the example from the slides before. Uh, this is uh, the same predict and loss uh, that we had originally. I've added some initialization code here using the, the random uh, network module. I'm sorry, the random uh, uh, numbers module. Um, and uh, I'm just creating some random parameters and then some random data. And I'll print the loss on that random data. OK, so the loss is 73, the squared loss here. Um, now, uh, here's a simple Python loop, 20 iterations. We wrote it just in, in, in plain old Python that uh, is going to use uh, the autodiff to, to compute the gradient of this function, of this loss. And then I'm just taking steps here uh, over every matrix and vector to do what should be gradient descent, uh, stepping opposite the direction of the gradient. 20 iterations. Let's print the loss again. It's lower. Uh, we just did machine learning. That's, uh, that's basically it. We can, we can, uh, we can stop there. <laughs> but but really we, we can do a lot more um, and uh, and 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 this is I think what's exciting about about autodiff and composition uh, we we have we have the ability to do uh, forward and reverse mode uh, autodiff if that speaks to you uh, grad here is reverse mode these are also composable with one another if you use it in that way we can get fast Jacobians and Hessians if you want to actually you know sort of build out those matrices. Uh, JAX has complex number support in its autodiff, and that includes both, both uh, holomorphic and non-holomorphic functions. Um, we can do uh, Jacobian pre-accumulation for element-wise operations, if that's something that speaks to you. Uh, and, uh, and, 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 you know, it, it sort of, th there's a lot more. So, so you, we have a, a cookbook in the, in the repository if you're curious to see kind of a deep dive or a deeper dive into autodiff uh, tricks. Now let's compile some stuff. Uh, so Jax, uh, I'm going to import JIT from Jax, and again create a big 5,000 by 5,000 array. Uh, and then I want to lo look at this function here. So this function is going to do 10 iterations in in Python, uh, and do some a lot of sort of element-wise arithmetic on the array. So the array will remain 5,000 by 5,000 as we run this loop. But at the end, it's going to return only a 1,000 by 1,000, or sorry, 100 by 100 uh, view of this array. Okay, so uh, in principle, if I run this sort of through the Python interpreter, although those operations will happen on the device, and, and out comes some numbers again that, that you can uh, uh, believe uh, I, are, are the correct ones for this computation, um, just trust me on that. Uh, it did actually do all those element-wise operations in the loop before slicing out uh, the only the subset that was needed. If we send this to an optimizing compiler, uh, it can actually notice that. Right? So if we send this to XLA and say, here's the entire computation, it will notice that only the, the small subset of the entries are actually read, and it'll pull them out, uh, and, and, or rather do away with a lot of the unnecessary computation. So here I'm going to compile it, run it again. That felt qualitatively faster. Let's time both. Uh, indeed, uh, compilers are great. right? So this is uh, uh, takes 31 uh, milliseconds uh, without uh, sending this through a compiler, and uh, and, and 200 mil microseconds, uh, you know, with with uh, with the compiler, and again, everything composes. We can call grad of jit of grad of jit of grad of jit, etc. Um, and it'll still, you know, what comes out still makes sense. Um, I'm going to stop uh, the demo right here just to move on. 
Um, there's things to say about the constraints uh, that JIT places on your code, but we'll actually get, get to that in a second. Um, there are more transformations. I, I keep sticking to gradients and, and, and compilation um, because it's, it's easy to talk about. Um, but we do have uh, so VMAP for vectorization, PMAP for parallelization. We have some experiment, yeah, experimental transformations like JET if you want to do um, Taylor expansion. So higher order auditive for Taylor expansions uh, can be made more efficient with a different transformation. Uh, we have experimental uh, uh, transformations for masking so that you have sort of processing ragged uh, ragged arrays uh, or variable length sequences. You can do shape checking uh, for convenience and debugging. I've mentioned probabilistic programming uh, with Oryx and, of course, uh, your own. Having reached the end of this, uh, I'm going to change the screen share again back to um, back to the slides. OK, so. Um, Right, so I want to go a little bit into how JAX works, though not in too great of detail. Um, and I want to ask you, what does this function, uh, what does this function do here? So you might be tempted to think that this function returns its argument plus two, uh, but X in Python can be of any type given only the Python source, and the meaning of plus can vary by type. So if X is one of these exp espresso remote objects, uh, then adding two, for all we know, could SSH into our espresso machine and start brewing two coffees. Uh, in other words, we don't know what f does without some type information about its arguments. And in Python, we only find that out when the function is called. Um, but we don't want to differentiate anyway. We don't, we don't care to differentiate f or compile f for all possible input types on Earth in advance. Uh, what we'd like to work with instead, uh, if we can, is a specialized version of this function f, specialized to ints or to floats or to two by three floating point arrays, uh, whatever we know we'll encounter actually eventually at call time or, or just in time for call time. So we can imagine some ways to specialize a function. One is to constrain its inputs by annotating its argument types. But from previous examples, you know that we don't use uh, annotations. What we're going to do instead is take advantage of the very same type ambiguity that got us uh, into this in the first place. Namely, instead of dropping in normal values, to specialize the function, we're going to drop in Python values uh, that we call tracers, so custom objects that we call tracers, that represent entire array types. Okay. And in our case here, uh, let's say that an array type is going to account for its shape and its element type. So our type here is all two by two float 32 arrays. We're going to let Python evaluate the function f on these tracers and use that for two purposes. One is we're going to, the, the tracers will let us observe and record the function's operation. Uh, and two, the, they'll propagate type information uh, as, as Python evaluates. Uh, for this latter bit, in programming language terminology, this is sometimes, as I understand it, called uh, abstract interpretation, if that speaks to you. Let's apply this to an example. Um, to the left is a Python function. And if we compile what's on the left for a scalar float argument, uh, we see our specialization to scalars on the right. This specialization, the specialized function here, uh, is staged out in terms of an internal mini language. Uh, we call this language the Jaxper internal representation, or Jaxper IR. Um, Jaxper is just short for Jax expression, just a name. Um, but both on the left and on the right, we see what we'd expect, which is that we're raising uh, to the power three and multiplying by two. Uh, I've mentioned this, that Jax has an important limitation, which is that your Python code must be written in a pure functional style, meaning there's no in-place mutation, no side effects. We have several reasons to require this functional style, uh, but one of them is a consequence of our implementation, our own implementation here. Namely, that this uh, tracing trick that I showed you uh, won't, won't notice side effects. Right? It, it, this will circumvent our tracing trick. So if we change f on the left here to append its argument to a global list, uh, it won't show up in the, it won't be captured. It won't show up in the corresponding uh, Jaxper. Now, again, uh, when we compile with JIT, we specialize the function to the shapes of its arguments. This means that we can use Python uh, control flow to branch on, say, the number of dimensions, because that's a known quantity of the type. It's part of the shape. In this case, uh, when I specialize to a scalar argument, we observe and stage out one branch, uh, the, the cubic branch. And if we trace uh, for a vector argument, sorry, for a vector argument, uh, we observe the other branch. These two, these two branches here specialized and staged out. But by contrast, we don't know enough, or rather we aren't specializing this function specifically enough in order to resolve a branch on the argument's value. Okay? Uh, we, we have to explicitly tell Jax to specialize further down to values, uh, to values about to happen. 
We can do that with a special argument to JIT, uh, or alternatively, we can uh, JAX offers some higher order control flow operations, like a function called cond um, of its own, so that you can call that in order to stage out an entire conditional into the JAX burn. You'll have to trust me that both of those options exist, since I didn't include them on this slide. Um, but moving on, I want to say that taking derivatives is a different story. Because we saw this in the, in the demo, in, in the notebook, that we can branch there on values uh, and still use an auto diff transformation. We used grad on a function that had one side uh, cubic and the other side linear. So what gives there? Um, what's the difference sort of between differentiation and compilation uh, that changes the, the type that, you know, that we specialize down to? So when a, function, uh, when a function that's output by, say, grad is called, we restrict to more than a shape and element type. We specialize down, uh, roughly speaking, to what we might consider a neighborhood or an epsilon ball uh, of values around the argument supplied, which is more specific than just the shape and element type. Hold that in your mind as we summarize this. Um, basically, different transformations require specializing to different types. So to fully, hypothetically, if I want to fully evaluate a function, we need to interpret that on fully concrete values. If we want to do auto diff, uh, we interpret the function abstractly over a neighborhood around its argument. And that's what allows us to resolve branches on values that are far from that point. Right? And to compile or vectorize uh, for VMAP, we interpret the function over shapes and element types that are compatible with the arguments. We don't know anything about values unless JAX has been told to accept them as static constants, so we can't branch on them. And if there were some hypothetical transformation that only needed this much, uh, we could keep going and interpret over, say, uh, arrays that have their element types known, but they don't have known or they only have partially known shapes. This is all uh, possible, and it's up to us to design the sort of types necessary for a particular transformation. So uh, that's how we stage out uh, a specialized expression into a JAXPR, but we still need to transform. Okay, and now the way that works is that for every primitive operation and transformation in the system, we have a rule written out in Python that carries out the transformation on that primitive. In this example, uh, the transformation uh, that, we'll, that we'll work with uh, is JVP, short for Jacobian Vector Product. This is really uh, just the forward mode auto diff uh, transformation. Okay, and uh, and a primitive operations JVP rule abstract uh, is it is something that interprets it um, both by by interpreting sort of the it interprets it by by computing the primal value of that operation and the tangent value of that operation. Okay, and now these are rules. Uh, so for for the primitive log, the log JVP is is to the right, um, and uh, and for every uh, Sorry, for the entire process of transformation uh, here uh, is then a non-standard JAXPER interpreter that we've also written in Python. So it interprets each primitive operation with a corresponding transformation rule. Um, and there's no need to go line by line into this uh, function here, uh, but it's basically an interpreter loop. Now, the interpreter loop is in Python. The transformation rules are in Python. So what's to stop us from tracing this entire process? And the answer is nothing. This is how JAX is able to recognize its own transformation action. It's a bit of a cartoon view made to fit into a slide, but it's essentially how JAX guarantees that transformations compose. OK, so in this case, uh, this entire process, uh, we can just drop in some tracers. We get a new staged out uh, JVP, but we can keep going. The real story is a little bit more complex. Um, this circle here is what we just covered. Basically, we go from Python function to specialized JAXPER expression, JAXPER an expression. Uh, and back by interpretation. Uh, but we also have uh, some machinery internally in the, in the project that, that avoids building up an actual JAXPER, effectively kind of inlining the action of the transformation. This kind of helps keep things fast. It can make things easier to debug. Uh, it can help resolve things like control flow. But that's a finer detail, and hopefully, uh, hopefully you get the picture. Um, so there are reasons that uh, scientists and engineers seem to like JAX, or so they've told us. Uh, its minimalism makes it easy to pick up and use. It's fairly fast out of the box. There are plenty of transformations with which to express the math that you'd like, at least today. Um, but this is one bit here that I'd like to highlight, is this feedback we've gotten on, on the functional programming model that we require. It's technically a limitation, but our users seem to really enjoy it, since it aligns uh, well with math, or at least some users do. Um, it encourages writing code with explicit data dependencies, which in turn makes it really easy to uh, reproduce results and to debug and so forth. Now, uh, on the system side, uh, this might be easy to overlook, but the mathematical definition of a derivative pertains to functions. Right? It doesn't pertain to circuits and graphs. It doesn't pertain to variables. It doesn't pertain to network layers. It's just, it's just defined in terms of functions. 
Um, so when you start to uh, worry about defining auto diff over complex numbers uh, or complex number valued functions uh, or differentiating recursive functions and loops or computing derivatives of derivatives of derivatives, it's, it, it becomes uh, useful to work with a, with a fully airtight definition of a derivative. Uh, and I mean this both as a system designer and as a user. So staying functional helps ensure clear semantics. Uh, of course, there are limitations too. Um, we've designed uh, JAX uh, in correspondence with NumPy's uh, bulk array programming model. So JAX isn't great uh, for code that has, isn't necessarily great for code with lots of nested loops over scalar operations. Uh, we do have some future plans uh, or experiments with offering certain escape hatches into other systems that might handle that better. Uh, higher level libraries are something that's still coming together. Uh, there are some great ones, great, great new ones out there uh, for neural nets and other things. Uh, but, you know, this, this is something that takes time for, for, for contributions to emerge. Uh, a few things could be faster. Um, and again, the functional programming thing, I have to list it on both, on both slides. It's also a limitation. Um, it's, and it's something that the user promises, so they have to bear this in mind. Uh, JAX has been used in some uh, exciting applications in scientific uh, domains uh, in particular, uh, also uh, used in, in creating a neural tangent kernel library, molecular dynamics simulations, some physics simulations. Um, I, uh, I'm going to skip ahead a slide before, uh, before my computer overheats here, and I'm not sure how well the animations are, sh are showing. Um, but, but, uh, but I want to stress that there are applications without animations, too, that I, I personally find pretty exciting. Uh, many of which are situated maybe we could say in a more machine learning foundations uh, context. We've seen it used for algorithms and optimization and control in probabilistic methods. Uh, recently, again, in, in differentially private learning, uh, which is which is great great to see. Uh, so I'll close with uh, sorry with some takeaways, um, lessons from Jax itself, and then some broader research directions in the space. As uh, as machine learning researchers, we want to stamp out math in code, uh, or we often do to do experiments and so forth. But research is an iterative process and our code shapes how we think. How do we make it to a point where we're writing large or, or medium scale uh, numerical code is part of our research process uh, rather than a final byproduct? This is a question that I think is, is interesting and underlies uh, uh, what we're doing here. To that end, uh, there are some lessons from JAX itself. Uh, so, so one is that functional programming is a virtue in this domain. Uh, both for system, both on the system design side and for the user. I'm being uh, careful here and scoping my claim narrowly to, to numerical computing. I don't mean to say that I happen to know that it's a great time to uh, write web servers in Haskell. Uh, I don't know much about writing web servers, uh, and I don't suspect that doing so uh, involves taking derivatives, uh, at, least, at least not today. Uh, and in machine learning, uh, functional programming, by contrast, really does seem to fit in well. Uh, we're doing mathematical work, and unsurprisingly, uh, a function is a useful abstraction. Another lesson is that compilers uh, are nice. <laughs> this is uh, this is something that we seem to uh, uh, learn again at least once every decade. Um, but compilers really allow a freedom of expression uh, to try completely new things. Uh, you know, re research it's it's not uncommon for research to be one step ahead in some ways of what's uh, optimized and engineered in library routines. And optimizing compilers let us write custom stuff, brand new custom stuff, without paying uh, performance costs for breaking the mold. And, and so there, there's an opportunity here, uh, I'd say, even, even outside of JAX. Uh, if you're interested in custom languages uh, or their design, I can say that plenty of uh, JAX's users uh, simply use it as a snappy XLA front end. They ignore all the other transformations. They just want uh, um, a compiler for their numerical Python. Um, it, it's an early joke of ours that uh, one of the one of the uh, secret meanings or alternate meanings of, of JAX is an acronym for just another XLA front end. Uh, as for broader research directions in this space, uh, we're all searching for this sort of essential set of primitives that enable machine learning programming and numerical computing. Uh, maybe we've discovered some so far with auto diff and with maps and masking and so forth, but this is an ongoing exploration. Uh, auto diff is a specifically interesting one, I think. Um, so you know, there's, there's work to do even on that uh, alone. I think that where mathematicians were once concerned with the differentiation of functions, uh, computer scientists still have things to sort out about automatic differentiation of programs. I'm thinking specifically of folks who study uh, formal aspects of programming languages and so forth. Uh, there are questions in language design. JAX goes to great lengths uh, to embed JAXpers. Uh, which is a functional, first-order, explicitly typed, super simple, lambda calculus-looking language 
into Python, uh, which is a reckless dynamic scripting language. Um, other projects uh, uh, try to try to not uh, uh, you know stack the themselves uh, against such an adversary. Um, they uh, there's the projects that are proposing new languages to see uh, what a more statically typed approach might offer. Um, a nearby example uh, for us is that some of the researchers involved in JAX also work on a language called DEX, which does array programming with typed indices. Uh, that's open source in case you're curious for more. And there are plenty of other other uh, work in the space. Um, we also Unsurprisingly, uh, plenty of systems questions. I mean, whenever multiple machines and multiple languages are involved, that seems to come up. Uh, and finally, uh, there's there's going back and using all of this for doing uh, new machine learning research. So I'll end here uh, with a link to our repository. And thanks for your time. Thanks so much, uh, Roy. That was great. And thanks for giving us demos as well. Um, that was very helpful to ground some of the stuff that you were talking about. Um, yeah, I can get us started. We had a couple of questions already in the chat. Um, for folks in the chat, feel free to uh, start sending questions. We also have uh, Matt, I think, who just joined. Uh, I'm not sure if he's around, but... Yeah. Um, there we go. Hey, hey, Ooh, Matt. Good job, Roy. <laughs> Thanks. Yep. This uh, is Matt, so, everyone. Uh, yeah, uh, maybe Roy can do some introductions for Matt as well. Yeah, Matt, Matt and I, uh, you know, we spend a lot of our time together these days uh, working together. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, Matt and I uh, uh, help make this project. And, uh, and uh, Matt's another machine learning uh, researcher originally with a bit of a compiler's background. Um, uh, we, uh, uh, yeah, uh, he <laughs> works with me and, uh, and, and uh, he does good work. Uh, <laughs> Um, so yeah, I guess uh, one question that came in was uh, about the tracers. Like, what are uh, one question was what are common tracers used for uh, compilation? Um, this was from here in chat. What common tracers are used for for JIT compilation? So for for JIT compilation, we we follow uh, XLA's restrictions or or sort of uh, uh, model. Okay, so so XLA is a, is an optimizing compiler for linear algebra. Um, where there's no dynamic memory allocation or anything. Everything is sort of uh, a fully static uh, program with known memory uh, and, and everything. So that's why we choose to specialize accordingly to shape an element type. That's basically kind of the, the amount of information needed to uh, compile an XLA program. Uh, and that's where that comes from. You know, I think if you're using a different machine model or a different compiler, uh, you know, the, the types will vary. Um, but, uh, but yeah, that, that, that's uh, that's all we do, sort of, um, to match XLA's model. Another quick question was uh, somebody uh, Shreya asked about uh, talking a little bit more about the dispatch overhead um, in Jax. Right. Um, so dispatch overhead, you know, it's it's something that uh, uh, requires engineering work. Um, currently, we do a dispatch asynchronously. Um, but uh, nonetheless, uh, there's an overhead involved in the dispatch of every op. Um, I honestly uh, am not uh, an expert on where our current bottlenecks are on this path uh, in, um, in terms of just where the system uh, has low hanging fruit. But, uh, but, I, but I do know that um, one answer I like to give uh, in this setting is use JIT uh, <laughs> you know, um, if you can. Uh, so so it's, it's, uh, it, you know, in the meantime, it's work in progress. We're making this uh, faster. It's a known performance bottleneck, but if you can take more ops and cram them into a mega op uh, that's optimized, that's that. Those are fewer launches, okay? and the fewer launches you have, the fewer uh, number of instances or occurrences of, of overhead you incur. Hey, Roy. I could add a little uh, extra onto that. Just you know, yeah, I, I agree that um, you know, JIT is our sort of performance sledgehammer, and uh, you know, most people. You know, the reason why we haven't spent many cycles optimizing dispatch overheads is because people can use JIT to like not only crush all um, you know Python dispatch overheads, but engage a lot of other optimizations. Uh, and you know that's you know that leads to to really good performance for workloads that you can apply JIT to. That said, yeah, the um, dispatch overheads are something where there's been a little work recently, so. Uh, luckily, the dispatch overheads are so bad that it doesn't take much work to, to make them better. I think there's something like uh, to dispatch to a JIT computation. It can depend on like the number of arguments to that JIT computation, but it's like at least 100 microse microseconds, maybe like 100 to 200 microseconds. 
So if you're dispatching to a JDA computation that takes milliseconds, maybe that doesn't matter because uh, you're doing some big matmuls and stuff. But if you're like dispatching to a lot of smaller kernels, then 100 microseconds is really painful. To give some kind of scale, I think um, you know NumPy is less than one microsecond uh, to dispatch. So, <clears throat> and I think you know things like like PyTorch is probably in a similar ballpark to to NumPy in terms of overheads because it's just calling directly into a C++ path. But uh, at the same time, I think it can take a handful of microseconds just to uh, do a like GPU kernel launch. So um, anyway, those are sorts of the the orders of magnitude. Someone actually recently, uh, no, someone not on the Jack's core team, um, but someone at DeepMind made uh, put one of our dispatch paths, sort of the dispatch path. If you're not doing any auto diff on top, if you're just doing sort of like dispatching a computation that's taking arrays and outputting you know raw arrays, um, uh, move that entirely into C++ uh, and uh, where sort of the, the the Python path is like a fallback um, if there are any traces involved. And so that got a, a big speed up. Uh, but I think ultimately Jax differentiates itself from you know other systems. It's not you know focused on um, making sort of eager dispatch as fast as possible. It really is about like using JIT as the as the main performance model. And that's worked well so far for like machine learning, especially deep learning uh, workloads. One thing I was uh, wondering a little bit during your talk uh, was what kind of motivated you guys to start building JAX um, in the beginning, um, especially when you uh, when uh, some of these you know machine learning applications there already exist well supported libraries like PyTorch or TensorFlow that have um, extensive hardware support. What was it kind of missing in those uh, other existing um, systems that that you kind of wanted to look at or uh, other like particular use cases that uh, you thought weren't being well served. Yeah, I think I think there are two uh, stories to tell here. Uh, one is about us as users, and one is about us as as uh, uh, curious kind of uh, uh, researchers uh, in in this realm of systems. Um, as users, you know, yeah, Matt and I uh, both came from uh, PhDs in machine learning, and we both were definitely on the sort of methods, algorithms, uh, theory side of things. And um, when we got started on this, I think that. This is a very qualitative, qualitative statement. I mean, uh, at the end of the day, it's all you know. Thing, this is all a computer, and we can do whatever we want uh, with it if we program it uh, uh, enough. Um, but uh, just just in the way things were structured, um, some of the applications that we may have cared about, uh, Matt and I, uh, one day, with our uh, uh, research um, mindset on on our, our machine learning research, we were we were wondering about doing some work in uh, in optimization and control. Um, and this was at a time, uh, this was you know 2017 and so forth. This was at a time when all these libraries were very optimized for neural networks. And and you know nowhere in our plan uh, of, of of potential research did we say uh, neural networks. Um, so it's not it's not that there was necessarily a hard limitation, uh, but it, it was a, there was a, a sort of opening, uh, okay, for for starting from from scratch. Um, and uh, and at the same time, yeah, we, we also uh, you know Matt's worked a little bit on compilers. I've worked a little bit on compilers in a, in, in sort of a non-academic uh, context necessarily, and um, and and we saw XLA. Uh, we saw the work being done there. We both uh, actually knew the person who was leading that project. Uh, Matt watched his talk, and uh, we were just curious to see if we could do things. Um, uh, on the on the systems design side, or just sort of uh, something that's a little bit more ergonomic uh, for for our applications, um, and then separately, I think there is a little bit of uh, um, this. Well, you know, Matt worked on Autodiff before um, before we had had this conversation, and uh, he worked on Autograd specifically, and uh, this seemed to XLA sort of seemed to work really well with that functional kind of model that was already in Autograd. Um, and and we wanted uh, higher order derivatives, and and we we didn't know exactly uh, whether we'd always get that. I think that uh, systems have co-evolved since, and differentiation has become better. Um, but fundamentally, uh, we like we like derivatives. We like the idea of taking a lot of them through our loops that do uh, the, uh, linear dynamical systems and control. Um, and so it, it's a it's a mix of of an application that isn't necessarily uh, in the current mold. Uh, as well as possibly advanced autodiff features, um, which we miss from Autograd, uh, but Autograd was not uh, uh, hardware accelerated, and we wanted to, to, to merge those two. 
Right. Yeah, to, if I can add on to that as well, to what Roy said, um, yeah, I, I uh, worked on the original uh, Autograd since like, you know, 2014. Um, and it was capable of doing a lot of things that we were using in our research that systems like TensorFlow or, uh, you know, PyTorch weren't able to do uh, early on. So like when we started JAX, I think Roy and I made some of the first, um, you know, prototype uh, sort of commits uh, in like very early 2017, like January, February. Uh, 2017. So PyTorch, I think, came out at the end of 2016 or so. And this is, you know, well before TF Eager and, and TF2 and this sort of thing. So from Autograd, we knew that, like, what kind of auto diff we wanted. Um, and that certainly wasn't the kind of auto diff that we had available in TensorFlow. I think I was also disappointed in TensorFlow because at the time, TF1 was like, you have to metaprogram in Python to, like, stage out a TensorFlow graph, but then it's still interpreted. And even, you know, back... Uh, you know, in 2014, working on Autograd, we've been talking about like, oh, if only we had an uh, array level optimizing compiler that could like take these uh, uh, programs that we're generating uh, in, in Autograd with tracing mechanisms and optimize them. And then, yeah, as Roy said, we saw a tech talk that uh, that the tech lead of XLA gave uh, in sort of, I think it was late 2016 or, or the beginning of 2017. And it was like the perfect thing to fit in with Autograd. So I think, you know, the, the capabilities of the systems at the time when we started JAX, they were very specialized to neural net training and sort of like pretty simple algorithms for doing that. No higher order auto diff, you know, uh, uh, this kind of thing. And, um, you know, we wanted to, to develop those capabilities. I think since then, uh, both TensorFlow and PyTorch have sort of adapted some of their auto diff uh, to look more and more like, uh, uh, like JAX's and like Autograd's before it. Um, with you know like a functional API, this sort of thing, um, and certainly you know moving into the space of adding uh, better ways to sort of stage out subparts of a computation while still having this like eager mode orchestration uh, model. Um, but yeah, certainly early on the, the the those limitations loomed really large. I think since then, Jax has had you know a lot of advantages that that uh, Roy uh, talked about that still set it apart and and help you know certain kinds of researchers do things more fluently using Jax like with automatic batching or simple parallel program model or this sort of thing um, that's just like helpful for, for researchers. Uh, so yeah, that was helpful for us in the early days when we were just building it as a tool for ourselves uh, before it like took on this life of its own. Actually, I can add some like flavor that I can say that personally, like the first time that I was exposed to Jax was through the uh, pirate team at Uber because they were trying to do, um, you know, um, trying to build a, a probabilistic programming language and they were looking for ways to actually do um, differentiation on, uh, on top of a compiled, uh, some compiled code. And so the fact that you can compose uh, compilational differentiation as your uh, operations, uh, that was you know, what, what made it it's like a pre pretty, let's say, uh, peculiar thing that maybe not many users will actually find super useful, but for some specific, uh, in particular research oriented um, applications that that's you know it's actually the difference between making something that works in particular in this case was for recursive functions um, as something that doesn't work right so that's actually something that uh, only Jack supports which is pretty amazing actually you know I have a really uh, high level question that I wanted to ask you guys that I'm really curious of which is as of today if you were to start a new project what is that new project that would make you use NumPy rather than using JAX? Why would someone still want to use NumPy today rather than using JAX? Yeah, I mean, uh, I, one, uh, one very simple answer uh, that isn't very high level is, is what we said earlier about uh, dispatch. Uh, if you're writing a, um, something low level, you know, something simple, uh, an experiment on your machine, um, you know, that's where, where uh, NumPy was uh, designed and, and um, it's still it's still great for that. Um, I think uh, you know it, it, what we don't need to again. Uh, Jax's interface is NumPy plus transformations, and I really like to to focus on the latter. Um, I, I I I put this I sort of put this under the rug in the presentation, but um, our basic set of primitives, so operations like division and, and addition and, and whatever, are actually not NumPy. Um, they are a smaller set, uh, a more basic set that we call uh, LAX. Um, which is a rotation of XLA in terms of lettering. Um, and that's actually what we think of uh, when we think of the set of, of, of operations out there to handle. Um, and Jax's transformations actually work on that. 
NumPy, Jax NumPy is actually implemented in terms of Lex. Okay, so um, what, you know, one one uh, one thing is to, to to bear in mind is that we stress NumPy as a out of the box interface uh, to Jax, um, but the underlying system uh, I could actually describe as Lex plus transformations. Um, I think that uh, there's also a lot of stuff in NumPy that we haven't yet. Uh, uh, well, I don't know if a lot of stuff, but there's certainly things in NumPy that we haven't yet covered. Uh, in our implementation, I'm thinking actually more of like SciPy. Um, we're still working on things like um, different representations, right? Sort of uh, uh, right now, everything's a bulk dense array. Uh, SciPy can do can do more today. Um, so uh, if I'm starting from scratch, that's that's uh, uh, the part of your question that's hard. Um, I wonder if Matt has anything to to jump in and say. Um, but uh, I think you know. If I wanted to, to do autodiff, which is now these days almost all the time, I, I have to use uh, something like this. And if I wrote it from scratch, it can't just be only NumPy. It needs to have uh, some sort of autodiff support uh, and, and also other things like vmapping and, and so forth and, and, and all that. Yeah, that's that sounds right. Like, you know, the NumPy and SciPy ecosystem still has a lot more sort of pre built functions. But yeah, you know, when would you use uh, NumPy? Um, there's some things that would like categorically you'd have to avoid. So like Roy mentioned autodiff. I guess you could use the original autograd, which is built on NumPy. Uh, so you know, like if you could even say like, okay, what what would make you use go back to the original autograd and and you know work with NumPy? Then I think if um, you had you could design a workload where uh, you know there's a lot of con like value based control flow uh, that you want to write in in Python. And you dispatch to a lot of small. You're not doing like big matrix multiplies. You're you're dispatching to a lot of small, um, you know, kernels. And you can't or don't want to use like a hardware accelerator. <clears throat> so like if you're going to run on the CPU, if your workload is such that uh, you know you want to have Python dispatching to a lot of smaller operations, so the dispatch overhead is really going to hurt you. Um, and maybe you don't need auto diff, or you're happy with uh, autograds auto diff. And you don't want to use like VMAP for batching. You don't want to parallelize uh, this sort of thing. Then, you know, it makes sense uh, to use it. I think there's still a lot of applications that actually fit the bill there. Like I don't know if you have a web server and you need to do some like light number crunching, um, you know, num on the CPU uh, efficiently. Maybe like NumPy is great for that. Or, like you know, financial applications. There's probably a million that I'm not thinking of because we're so embedded in this like deep learning uh, world now. But yeah, th those are kind of the the criteria where um, you know, no auto diff, but like lots of small kernels. It's interesting about Jax because in a way, NumPy is already not great if you're doing if you're launching a lot of small kernels, so to speak, right? Like if you have very loopy Python code um, operating on small matrices, we already have this intuition that like, oh, maybe I can't write that in Python NumPy. Maybe I need to like lower it into Cython to get those like Python overheads away. Um, so Num NumPy already had that. Like when we were writing NumPy code in grad school, maybe we would sometimes drop into Cython or something like this to uh, to accelerate those, those pieces where we couldn't sort of stay in, in Python and NumPy. Um, Jax kind of like heightens those uh, uh, heightens that cliff in a way where if your program fits in like the bulk array model, so you can JIT it, um, or if you know the arrays are really big, uh, you know you don't have to JIT it, but you can uh, you know pay the higher dispatch overheads. Uh, in some ways, it's like a heightened version of NumPy in terms of uh, sort of performance trade-off. Um, but yeah, I guess, I guess, yeah, it, it, no, the short answer is like, no, no auto diff, but like lots of small operations, um, but you know, big enough so that you don't want to write it and write them in Cython, then you'd use, use NumPy. Yeah, those are great answers. Thank you, guys. And I mean, if you take this to an extreme, uh, you know, down to scalars, like I've got loops over loops over loops over scalars. Uh, so we're removing NumPy from the picture now and just talking about small arithmetic operations. Um, that is actually, uh, uh, you know, not as I mentioned, not something we handle super well, and and it's uh, on the one hand work in progress, but on the other hand, it's it's we have to come at it from something from a different angle entirely if we're going to handle that. Um, and uh, and speaking of starting from scratch, you know, that is actually something that uh, this language uh, Dex that I mentioned that um, um, some 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 of our colleagues work on um, uh, is is exploring. Right? So that is actually a, a language in which you can. Um, Work with scalars uh, and expect auto diff and everything, um, and and still uh, compile entire uh, sort of custom kernels. I think if you wanted to write a Kalman filter that operated on a state dimension of like 100 by 100 or 200 by 200 or something, so it's not so small that you need to write it in Cython, 
but it's not you know big enough to wash out uh, you know overheads. You don't need to differentiate. You don't need to like batch or anything like that. Then maybe NumPy is uh, the perfect option. I just want to yeah underscore that like NumPy serves a zillion different needs. Jax is like a more niche um, thing, but like NumPy is you know uh, incredible. It's something we've all used uh, a zillion times, and like it has applications all over the place. So NumPy I think is still going extremely strong. It makes sense. Makes sense. We we had a couple uh, interesting questions in the chat um, that that we want to try to get through quickly. Uh, one of them, so Daniel Kang asks, some ML algorithms, and I, men, I imagine uh, many other you know, algorithms and, uh, and workloads, require tracking state, um, like tracking some statistic of loss during training and training and changing training based on it. Uh, do you have thoughts on how to implement things like that given the, the functional interface injects? Yeah, it's, uh, it's sort of out of the box. It's a bit of a challenge. Um, one uh, broad statement that is uh, JAX independent is that um, Things like tracking state and uh, having effects uh, is not inherently in and of itself uh, not, not something you can do functionally. Um, it's the implementation of those things with through side effects uh, that we're used to. Um, that said, you know, uh, it takes more work. You have to uh, track the state uh, or know that you're doing so. Uh, you have to do so explicitly. Uh, it'd be super useful if the language actually helped you do those things. And certainly languages like you know, Haskell or OCaml and so forth uh, offer you more constructs to do so. Uh, in Python, we have to lean harder on libraries that we ourselves build uh, in order to do things like track state uh, according to common patterns. Um, this is what's done in some of the higher level libraries built with JAX. Um, if you just look at the neural net libraries, indeed, there you have to track some state, sometimes through an optimizer uh, or a training procedure, uh, track metrics uh, for your loss, and so forth. Uh, and they will encapsulate that. Um, subject to Jax's constraint. And so, so one short answer is uh, take a look at their design. You know, take a look at Flax and Haiku and and uh, um, and, and, and traps and objects. And objects, if you, yeah, and objects yeah. specifically. Objects looks Ob a lot like, like PyTorch, so that might look very familiar. Exactly. Objects is sort of uh, trying to, you know, it's going to be compatible with Jax uh, on the one hand. So it's, it's, it uh, conforms to its constraints. Uh, but on the other hand, it, it does give you something like a, 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 a capital V variable, like sort of a mutable um, cell. Um, and, and so these things are possible. Uh, they require work. I think in, in, in Python specifically, they require careful work. Um, and uh, and it's, a, it's sort of uh, you know, contributions welcome in, in, in finding good ways to abstract um, somewhat uh, not, not easily functional things uh, in, in a functional way. No, that's a great segue. I, I'll ask you a little bit about the ecosystem around JAX. Like, um, I think there was another question about experimental features like um, computing log probabilities, and, and uh, you talked about log densities. Um, so uh, I think the question was around like, how are these extensions actually implemented? Casey asked this question, like, is this pretty well um, fit in into how JAX is implemented and things like that? So would you comment a little bit about the ecosystem uh, to support particular applications for both like statistical applications as well as, as, well as like machine learning? Can yeah. I comment on yeah, the no, no. functional bit? Oh, and then also I can. <laughs> into the, you know, my PhD is nominally about uh, something to do with probability, so I have a good you know, finger on the pulse there. But about the, the functional uh, nature, I just wanted to add one more angle, which is there's some um, aphorism. I don't know where it originally comes from, but uh, our friend Dougal likes to say it. I think he got it from Alexi Radul, but who probably got it from Jerry Sussman or something. But um, the, the statement is that state is a trick you can only play once in your system. And the idea is that um, it's actually hard to like compose uh, systems that have sort of arbitrary side effects, um, but it's easy to write one layer, uh, you know, that, that can do it. And so one way of looking at the sort of state management problem, um, you know, if you think about, you know, take a library like Objects or really any of these other uh, higher-level uh, neural net libraries, um, they sort of allow, you know, a stateful kind of uh, a programming model. Um, and what they do, you know, under the hood is they just sort of functionalize it. They're tracking all the uh, references um, under the you know uh, behind the scenes, and they plumb them in as uh, inputs and produce them as outputs uh, of the functions that they hand off to Jax. So Jax is sort of like a purely functional layer. Um, I think that makes it actually relatively easy to consume because it doesn't have uh, you know side effects that are very controlled. And some of these higher level libraries sort of add a, a stateful uh, kind of programming model on top. And I think it's actually somewhat easier for them to do that because. Uh, you know, Jax is just a, a functional API. Um, 
But maybe then in turn, it would be harder to build things on top of those libraries because, or even to compose those two different, you know, two different higher level JAX libraries. It's actually a problem right now. It's hard to like mix code from Haiku and from objects because they both have different takes on how to do state uh, management and like stateful programming. So the high level idea is just that, um, you know, if you can only play the sort of stateful card, uh, state, uh, state like programming uh, once in your system, um, uh, but until you do, you can like build a lot of reusable composable pieces. Jax is trying to like build the purely functional uh, layer and the you know functional API, and then maybe these layers on top uh, can can sort of um, you know consume that uh, more easily. Anyway, that's just one you know interesting angle on statefulness. The question was about uh, like probabilistic programming and, and yeah, well, I think I think they were you know they were asking about higher level libraries and and where those slot in. Um, and I, th I actually read, uh, if, if, if it's correct uh, to interpret this question twofold, uh, it seems like we're talking about things like probabilistic programming, uh, libraries that specifically use JAX's internal machinery, um, or sort of the, the interpreter idea, uh, to extend it with new transformations, versus higher level libraries like the, the neural net ones, which are actually uh, uh, unaware of JAX's internals and build on top of it. Uh, I wanted to defer to, to Matt specifically to talk a little bit about the, the extension ones, because uh, yeah, he has a background in in probabilistic methods and probabilistic programming. Yeah. All right. Cool. Thanks. Um, yeah. I guess in for probabilistic stuff in general, not not the like uh, adding new transformations. Um, you know, there there are some uh, libraries that are that are cropping up. Like actually, TensorFlow probability, um, sort of the uh, that whole library now can work with Jax as a backend. I think that I think that's pretty powerful. But yeah, in terms of the sort of custom transformations, um, so we have a tutorial on if you go to jax.readthedocs.io on writing your own Jaxper interpreter, it's kind of like a semi-internal API, by which we mean sort of we like to disclaim that the whole thing is a research project and we, you know, there might be bugs and we might break things. But you kind of have like a public um, API, like the you know most well-documented parts that those things are really stable. Um, writing your own Jaxper interpreter starts to use more Jax internals, and you know we might change those more often. So it's a little bit of a uh, you know hazardous ground, but we do have this tutorial on, on how to write them. And I think the example tutorial is um, was written by someone who was uh, doing something similar for a probabilistic programming library. The, uh, uh, the example in the tutorial is writing a Jaxper interpreter for um, automatically inverting functions. So like functions that are sort of structurally invertible or reversible, uh, you know, be able to say, you know, hey, given this Function, given this Python callable, give me a new Python callable that computes the inverse of the original function or fails if uh, for some reason it, it can't do that. Um, yeah, so anyway, that's, you know, take a look at that tutorial in terms of writing your own uh, interpreters. The best example, that, so the person who wrote that tutorial uh, is one, our colleague named uh, Sharad uh, Vikram, and he has a fantastic uh, library called Oryx, which has been experimenting heavily in the space of adding custom JAX, uh, uh, sort of JAX for interpreters for purposes like these. So I think, I forget if it was mentioned in the question, but like canonical problem of if I write a program that draws a sample from a uh, you know, probability distribution, sampling some latent variables, and then you know, sampling some, some output variables that depend on that, that kind of thing. Um, if I you know, write a program that draws a sample, give me back a program that evaluates the log joint density. And that's a useful transformation because maybe for inference, for posterior inference, you want to take the log joint density and then differentiate it and do Hamiltonian dynamics or something like this. Um, so that Oryx library uses um, uh, custom JAX transformation to, to do that, I think, um, to sort of solve that problem. It also has other transformations, like I mentioned the uh, sort of the inverse transformation. Um, you know, oftentimes people write probabilistic models in terms of sort of uh, smooth differentiable bijection functions from one probability distribution to another. And in those cases, it's useful to be able to do things like compute inverses or compute um, uh, sort of log debt Jacobians uh, efficiently. And uh, Sherrod has transformations related to those kinds of computations um, as well. And he also has his own sort of take on, on state management uh, that's also written using Jack's internals. Um, so I think Oryx is a great example library. And I think there's a, a notebook that shows off what it can do. Um, but that's like a great example of someone writing a sort of domain specific uh, custom uh, you know, set of Jax interpreters to extend the system, and then also, you know, he does things like differentiate through them and and JIT compile them and that sort of thing. Maybe another another example is like our former um, 
uh, intern and, and collaborator uh, Jamie Townsend has, uh, you know, he's done some work on custom Jaxper interpreters to do like fast autoregressive sampling, which is kind of also in this space where you could take an autoregressive probability model and kind of like, um, if you've seen the sort of like fast wave net decoding kinds of things, uh, he has some, some transformations um, that look like that. So it's not, you know, I don't think because we haven't like sort of totally, uh, you know, finalized these APIs and declared them super stable, um, it tends to be more, you know, sort of Jack's uh, uh, semi collaborators, not people on the core team, but like uh, people in the in the periphery uh, who sort of know us, who end up writing sort of custom Jax interpreters for their, uh, you know, bespoke to their their problem. Um, but it seems to actually work. Like people, these maybe are too niche to, uh, uh, or you know, you know, too niche to have in the Jax core library itself. But people have actually succeeded in adding their own transformations uh, like that. So yeah, check out Oryx. I think it's, um, if you Google Jax Oryx, it's O-R-Y-X. That's probably a good example. Awesome, yeah. Um, yeah, I think uh, there's a few other questions, but uh, we're uh, a little over time. So we'll just, uh, maybe uh, you can comment on them in, in, in the video later, uh, a couple of days later, the, the live chat will pop up again, you can do that. But um, thank you so much for joining. And uh, it was really great to hear um, the story behind Jax as well as uh, more of the details. And I, I can tell you guys are pretty opinionated, which uh, kind of shows in how you propose as well. So that's, uh, it's really nice to see that. Um, and thanks a lot for people who tuned in. Um, if you have more questions, I'm sure you feel free to message and email them um, separately. I'm sure they have websites that you can find. Um, and uh, you, you should also visit our website, mlsys.sanford.edu, sign up for our mailing list, subscribe. Uh, next week, we're going to be off for Thanksgiving break, but we'll be back the week after. So we'll see you in two weeks. Um, thanks, everyone. Uh, bye to the audience. And thanks. Yeah, thank you.